It's time for us to check back in with Alex Stewart and see what happens next. If you've missed any of the previous readings, please look in the description below for a playlist. Tell me about your partnership with the sheriff in the moonshine business. Alex laughed. This sheriff come up once to raid me, and he sat down and talked a long time, and directly he said, I like to have a good drink of liquor. I said, I ain't got none. He said, now I ain't here to cause you any trouble. I got a drink of your liquor the other day, and that's the reason I come up here to get another drink. And I thinks to myself, now he's going to pull something on me, but I finally told him, let me see if I can find you a drink. I never turned a man down for a drink in my life if I had it. So I went and got him a drink, and he sipped and sipped on it. And finally he said, now that's real liquor. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll furnish the sugar, and I'll get rid of it, and you make the liquor, and we'll go havers. We agreed to go into business together, but we needed a safe place to put the steel. Sheriff, I said, the best place to put that steel is right in your smokehouse. Nobody would have ever expected to find a steel in your smokehouse. And if they saw every bit of smoke, they just think you were smoking your meat. It's handy there, close to water and everything. He finally agreed. I guess me and him made a thousand gallons or more. We'd make 18 to 20 gallons every run, and I'd make a run every week. The sheriff was in debt. He was just up against it till we got into that. He was too much of a ladies' man and spent everything he'd get on women and liked to have ruined himself. We started making liquor together, and I put him back on his feet. You mentioned once that the Federal Revenuer paid you a visit one time. He had the name of being the worst man there ever was in our country. He was a government revenuer, and he'd killed seven men. He killed three men at one time up in Kentucky. He wore a metal jacket all the time. A bullet wouldn't faze him unless it hit him in the head or down in the legs. Did he ever get shot? Yeah, they shot him two or three times, but it didn't amount to nothing. I was working one day splitting some wood and putting it up in the woodshed. He walked up on me and liked to have scared the life out of me. I thought to myself, I'm a goner this time. I had, I guess, 15 or 20 gallons of corn liquor up in the smokehouse loft with some stuff thrown over it, and he come up and said, Bud, you got any liquor? I said, No. I was telling the truth. I didn't have none in my hands. He asked me a whole lot of questions, and finally he says, I've drunk some of your liquor, and that's the reason I'm here. Come to find out, a doctor I was selling to had let him have a drink, and he made the doctor tell who made it. Well, I finally said, I've got a drink I might give you. I had a quart can sitting in there in the cupboard, and I went and got it. He took it out of my hands, tasted it, and said, That's the best liquor I've got since I've been a revenue man. How much you got? I says, I ain't got much of it. He said, I want a gallon. A man that makes liquor like that ought never be bothered. I kept him in liquor right up until he started attending holiness meetings. He got saved and went to preaching, and he never did come back for any more liquor. I figured after he got saved that he'd sure pour it on me. I said, I've played the devil now, but he never did name it to me, and he didn't live but a little while after that. Although the revenuers weren't out looking for you, it was still necessary for you to hide your operations, wasn't it? Oh yeah, you had to keep everything out of sight. At first, I moved my steel around to write smart. I soon got tired of that, and I dug me a big hole right near the barn about six foot square and four feet deep. I put planks over that and covered it with corn cobs, shucks, and such. You could walk or drive a team of horses over that and never know it was there. I used hard dry wood to burn, and it didn't hardly make no smoke at all. Sirewood, dogwood, and oak is best. I think you told me once that you and Ellis made whiskey for a while. Alex chuckles at the recollection of those days. We made liquor together for years. Ellis was a good hand to work, but he never could make liquor. 
he ruin it every time. He sent word for me to come up there one time, and when I got there, he wanted me to help him make a run, and that's how come us to get started together. We dug us a big pit, a room nearly half a big, as big as this house, right there in the front yard. We covered it with chestnut logs and then put dirt on that. We had a little trap door, and we hid that door with a shock of corn fodder. There's where we made our liquor. Ellis would pack the water and such as that and do anything I needed doing. We had a peephole, and one day we was a-sitting there getting ready to come off with a run, and we saw the law a-coming. The sheriff and two deputies. That liked to have scared Ellis to death. He jumped up and said, Alex, get out of here. Run for the ridge. Said, you've got a family to feed, and I ain't. Said, I'll stay here and take the blame. Well, I wouldn't leave, just sat right still, and Ellis saw I wasn't going to run, so there he went, headed out the ridge like a rabbit with the dogs after him. The law went up and sat down on the porch, and I slipped around and went in the back door, come through the house, and sat down with them. They raided Herbie Collins over on Blackwater and poured out two barrels of his mash. After a while, the sheriff asked if we had any good liquor, and I went in the kitchen to get some. They all took them a drink, bought them a half gallon, and went on. Well, about supper time, here come Ellis in from the ridge. He was all scratched and skinned up and scared and trembling. He said, I thought we is caught for sure. Apparently, you had a lot of interesting customers. I even had a preacher that would buy a little liquor off me once in a while. He was as good a man as you could find anywhere. If anybody was living right, I believe that old man was. He didn't know a letter in the book, but he'd go preach every Sunday if they wasn't but one soul in the church house. Now, he had a son-in-law who followed drinking. He bought a gallon off of me on credit. He'd been a soldier in World War I, and he drawed a pension. He said, when my check comes, I'll pay you for it. Well, he got into a meeting and got sort of stirred up and pretended to get saved, and he never did pay me. I never did think the man was saved. What did you use to make whiskey and brandy? I've made liquor out of about anything you could think of. Barley, raisins, grapes, pawpaws, dandelions, rye, corn, peaches, apples, plums, simmons, tomatoes, and on and on. I threatened to make it from bananas, but I never could get me enough. I made brandy out of lots of stuff people said wouldn't make brandy at all. Brandy is hard made. If you don't understand it, you'll just make a flash every time. I've made it out of apples, peaches, blackberries, and lots of things. I used to have a field up there on the ridge, about 12 acres, and it was just covered with blackberry briars. People would come from everywhere to pick them berries. I'd make brandy out of them, and I'd hardly ever put any sugar in it. I always used molasses in making blackberry brandy. It suited it better. I've made many a gallon of blackberry brandy, and it was good. I wish I had a little snort of it right now. Apple brandy was very popular, wasn't it? Oh, you couldn't hardly beat good apple brandy. I gathered up a great lot of sweet apples up here at George Stewart's place once. I squeezed out the juice, and they made three big barrels full. I set them barrels in the cornfield and put a big corn shock around each so no one would know where's they's at. It took them till long about Christmas to work off and make good hard cider. Then I took it and run it through my steel and made brandy. Everybody that took a drink of it said it was the best brandy they ever tasted. They was a lawyer down here in Sneedville, and he started supplying me with sugar. He wanted to buy every drop of brandy I made. He'd give it to them big lawyers down in Knoxville when they'd come up here. He ruled things in this country, and he said I never need worry about getting prosecuted as long as he was around. I understand that one of the oldest types of alcoholic drinks was a wine called mead, made from honey. Did you ever make that? We called it figlin instead of wine. You take a good honeycomb and put it in a jar and pour some water over it and let it set till it works off. It makes the best drink you ever drunk. It'll make you feel funny, but it won't make you drunk. It's about like beer. You were going to tell me about getting raided. 
My first cousin, Eli Jones, lived over here across the ridge. You knowed him. Him and his wife made liquor and bootleg liquor, and the people got after them over there, and he couldn't put his steel nowhere that they wouldn't find it. He come up to my home and wanted to know if he could come and make some whiskey on my place. I said, if you can make it and get by with it, I don't care, but I don't want it made close to the house. I took him way back up to an old pasture field where there was a big rock pile with bushes and briars growing up around it. Right off from it, about 50 to 75 feet was water, and I said, right there's a good place for you to make liquor, Eli. He got in there and put up two barrels and made three or four runs and took a notion to quit. He hadn't been quit long when Charlie Mullins run for sheriff and was elected. Eli went down there and got in with Charlie, and Charlie put him in as a deputy. It wasn't long till Eli brought the sheriff and another feller by the name of Collins up here to raid me. Eli wanted to be sheriff and thought leading a few raids like that would help him. He brought them up here and me and Hugh Nichols was out rabbit hunting. I looked down the ridge and there sat Charlie on the fence, the sheriff. Just about that time, the dog jumped a rabbit. I told Hugh, you wait right here and I'll go kill that rabbit. I walked out and there was Eli hunting for my steel. I raised that shotgun, cut right down at him and shot. Buddy, you talk about somebody getting gone. I put two shots through his hat. Hugh and the sheriff thought I was shooting at the rabbit. I stood there and watched Eli go just as hard as he could go. I come out down where Charlie was and we all come on down to the house and they said they needed to wait on Eli. They didn't know he'd done run plumb off the ridge down to where they'd parked their car. While they's waiting, the sheriff said, Well, we've looked everywhere, and we know they ain't no steel up here. And he sort of laughed. After a while, they walked on down the ridge to where their car was parked, and when they got down the road, there sat Eli with them two holes in his hat. That liked to have tickled the sheriff and Collins to death. They said later that I'd done exactly right. He's down there looking for signs, had a stick pulling the briars back, looking for a trail that led from the water and poking around everywhere when I spotted him. That's when I let him have it. He just flew off that ridge, Alex laughed again. If he'd been close enough, I'd shot him till he never run airy step again. I sure showed him the way out. I sent him word that he better never show up on the ridge no more, and as far as I know, he didn't. He run for high sheriff years later, and he asked me to vote for him. I said, son, if you never get a vote till you get one from me, you'll never get nary one. Just a while before he died, he was in the hospital down here at Sneedville. I was down there, went to see somebody that was awful bad off. I forget who it was now, but Eli was in the bed right over there from them. And I spoke to him, and I asked him how he was getting along. Oh, he sort of grinned and turned his head over and said, I ain't doing no good. And I believe he died about a day or two after that. All the moonshiners tell me their worst enemies were the other moonshiners, not the law enforcement people. Did you find that to be true? Oh, yeah. Every time the law come around, it was because some other feller who made liquor turned me in. Mine was better than theirs, and everybody knowed it. I was getting all the business, and they would turn me in, hoping to get shed of me. Alex, where did you get your stills? Oh, I made them, and I made a heap of them for other people. I'd go over here at Rogersville and buy the copper and make them. In the early days, when copper was not available, how was whiskey made? I heard an old man once say they used an iron kettle and a blanket. Oh, yes, that's what they used before they had any material to make a regular steel. Put your mash in an iron kettle and then take out a yarn blanket, double it, and put it over your kettle. Then you boil it real slow, sort of let it steam a little, and that blanket caught the steam. When the blanket got so wet it couldn't hold no more, you'd wring it out in something and you'd have your liquor. I understand the price of whiskey went up during Prohibition. Oh, yeah. Why, I remember when you could buy all the liquor you wanted for a dollar a gallon. Then after this prohibition came about, it got as high as $30 a gallon. That's when a lot of people got into making liquor just for the money, and they'd do anything to get a runoff. A heap of times, it was poison. 
I've heard of people dying of poisoned whiskey. What causes it to become poison? Some people would put lye in their whiskey to make it bead. That's the way you tell the strength of liquor, you know, by the size of the bead that comes on it when you shake it. You could put a little lye in it and you'd have great big beads and that made it look like good strong liquor. It tastes strong too. They'd get old car batteries and take the water out of them and put it in their liquor. That would make it bead. I don't know of the people that died of drinking bad liquor. There's a feller lived right up here named Lee Miller. I don't guess they was a better man in this country. He started down here to Sneedville to court one day, and he stopped to talk to another feller, and he gave Lee a drink of liquor. Now that one drink of liquor killed him. They thought it had lye in it. Some people will do anything for a nickel. When the price got so high, I suppose most people use sugar, yeah, you could make it so much faster by using sugar. Straight corn liquor is a lot better, but it takes a heap longer to make. Straight corn liquor's got a better taste. You can get so drunk you won't know where you're at in the world, and quick as you sober up, you feel just as good as you did before you drunk it. Maybe better. They ain't nothing no better for medicine than straight corn liquor. Did you char your whiskey? I've done that several times. You want to get white oak and take the sap off it, then split the timber in small blocks and take and char it. Just burn it like you was making charcoal. Put that in a barrel of liquor and let it set four or five days and boy your liquor will look like coffee. That gives it a good taste and a good flavor too. Were there quite a few people in your neighborhood who made whiskey? Oh, they's might near half the people up there on the ridge that made liquor at one time or another, men and women. Did the women actually make it? Yeah, I recollect two old women that lived up the holler here and made liquor all the time. Grandpap had made them a big hogshead barrel that held about a hundred gallon. They never did pay him for it, and one day he sent Pap and Dan Creech down there to see if they could get them women to pay him a little bit. They got to the house, and there wasn't no one there. Pap and Dan stood around a while, and then they heard somebody talking down around the creek. They walked down there and learned the voices were coming from that big hogshead. Both of them women were in that big barrel, stomping down the mash, stark naked. They didn't have a stitch of clothes on. Pap told them what they was after. They said the only way they had to pay for the hog's head was with honey. They kept a few bees. Pap and Dan come on up to the house, and then women got out of that mash, washed off in the creek, and put on their clothes. They come up to the house and give Pap a gallon of honey for payment. Now, Pap said that was the truth. Were either of them married? They didn't have no men folks, but they had several children. Making liquor was the only way they had of making a living. Law, they had it hard. The people who made whiskey were called moonshiners, and the ones who sold it for the moonshiners were called bootleggers. Where did these terms come from? A lot of people made their whiskey of a night by moonlight. I reckon that's why they got to calling it moonshine. Back then, most all the men wore boots. They'd tie their breeches around their leg and their boot with a string, and that way they could put a bottle in the top of their boot and nobody would notice it. They'd go around where they was holding court or where an election was being held and sell it. When they wanted to get their bottle, they'd slip around behind a building and untie that string and get it out. All of Alex's neighbors spoke highly of him, but a few alluded to his fondness for old John Barley Corn. During my first years of visiting him, Alex kept a little liquor hidden near his workshop. He had dug a small hole underneath the floor of a log crib where he kept a jar or a bottle. He kept it covered with a plank and would kick a few corn cobs over it so there was no trace of the hidden spirits. Once when Alex and I were out buying items for the museum, we visited an old moonshiner who lived on the banks of the Clinch River. He didn't know me very well and wouldn't admit to having any moonshine, but he offered us beer instead. Alex accepted one, turned the bottle up, and drained it completely, removing it from his lips only once. When I commented on how fast he drank it, he seemed surprised. Why, pshaw, son, that's the way I drunk beer back when I followed drinking. I can't stand this sup, sup, sup. I just always take two drinks to a bottle. 
I could drink it all in one drink if I could hold my breath long enough. He had quit drinking years before this, and the scanty supply under his corn crib was for medicinal purposes only, or so he said. His son, Mutt, disapproved vehemently, so Alex hid it away from the house. Though I never saw him the least bit in intoxicated, Alex made no secret about his drinking in the early days. Alex, you mentioned a time or two that you not only made moonshine, but that you also drank a good deal. I drank a pint or more of liquor every day for, I guess, 40 years. I lived on it, got to where I'd have to have it set by my bed. Along in the night, I'd wake up and have to take me two or three swallows before I could go back to sleep. How old were you when you started drinking? I was just a boy when I first started taking a drink, eight or nine years old. I recollect the first time ever I took a drink of liquor. The Bell family lived right up above us, and they made and sold liquor. Pap never drunk, but he never bothered them, never give them no trouble nor nothing. One day, two fellers come by our place and wanted to know where they could find some liquor. I said, we don't fool with it, but if you need some, you take that road and go about three quarters of a mile, and you can find some, I guess. One of them asked would I show them the way, so I went along. They bought them a half gallon of liquor, and they give me a drink of it. I took it, and lol, I thought that was awful. That was the first liquor I ever drunk. There was another feller who lived right close by the name of Joe Ogle. Joe was about the worst crippled feller ever I seed, and he couldn't work much, only made a little liquor. I used to help him do things, and he thought a lot of me. One day, Mother sent me out there to borrow some coffee. Joe was sitting on a big rock with a jar of liquor beside him, and he said, Here, I'm going to give you a drink of whiskey. Do you want it? I said, Yeah, I'll take it. I drank some of it and made me pert near drunk before I got home. From then on, I went out there and got whiskey from him any time I wanted it. That got me used to it, and I drank whiskey for, I guess, 50 years. After I learned how to make it, I never did buy much liquor, and I never did get dog drunk but one time in my life. Was that when you were young? Yeah, I was out in the woods, and I catched a big mud turtle and took it to Joe's, and he said he'd give me a quarter for it if I'd clean it and fix it for him to eat. Well, I took that quarter and bought me a pint of liquor from him. I drank most of that, and before I got home, I was so drunk I didn't even know where I was at. Did your daddy find out that you were drinking? He found out about it some way, and oh, he give me a jacking up. He said, now that's the worst habit you ever got into in your life. You better quit that. But I didn't listen to him. I got to where I could turn up a half a pint of liquor and drink every drop of it. And you wouldn't have known it if you hadn't have smelled it on me. You never missed any work on account of your drinking? Oh no, it just helped me to work and to eat. That was the first thing I'd drink in the morning. I'd go feed my team before breakfast so they'd eat by the time I got ready to go. And I'd keep me some at the barn. I'd drink me a drink or two and come back and eat breakfast. I'd get ready to go to work, and I'd take another drink and go. I'd hide me out two big kegs in the field and cover it over right good. When I was plowing, I'd stop the team every once in a while and get me a drink. I'll swear by the time I lay the crop by, I'd have both them kegs of liquor drunk up. I can take you up there today and show you that hole where I kept it buried. What made you decide to quit, and how were you able to give it up? It was getting a hold on me, and I had to quit. Got to where I couldn't eat or nothing. I said I'd quit if it killed me, and I'd done just what I said. For two weeks, I couldn't be still. Couldn't hold nothing without just jerking and trembling all over. I thought it was going to kill me. Margie said, ain't you got something that you can drink that will stop that? I said, yeah, but I'm not a drinking it. I've quit. I stayed right with it, and it finally left me and didn't bother me no more. I've never craved liquor no more like I did. Chapter 10, The Pioneer Community. Oh, what a time we'd have at a house raising. When a family or a community of families must struggle daily for enough food and clothing merely to survive, it is unlikely they'd be given to attending gatherings and meetings merely for the purpose of socializing. 
but by the same token, there exists, it seems, an innate yearning in people to meet and interact with others. The Frontier Society met this need in its usual innovative fashion. People had their gatherings, their visitations, but when they did so, it served a utilitarian purpose. They seeded cotton while visiting with neighbors for the coming of the new year. They peeled apples, broke and strung beans, shucked corn, and made quilts as they visited. The people also met and visited at church, baptizings, and funerals. There were few, if any, instances where they gathered solely for recreational and or social purposes. This frontier attitude was very much alive when Alex came upon the scene. He vividly remembers such events and actively participated in many of them. Alex, all the history books, it seems, speak of log rollings, quilting parties, and so forth, about how the neighbors would get together and have workings. Do you remember any of these? Lord, yeah, we've had many of them. Corn shuckings, bean shellings, candy pulling, and apple peelings. It wasn't no trouble to get people to come to a workin'. They wasn't many people here then, but everybody that you'd ask to a bean stringing or a corn shuckin' or something would come if they's able to get there. You couldn't have that no more. I'd hate to think about trying to have a corn shuckin' now. Wouldn't be two people show up. Back not long after I was married and living on the ridge up there, I was cleaning up a piece of ground about five acres to put out my corn crop. It was getting late, and I knowed I wouldn't get a crop if I didn't get it cleaned and planted right away. I decided to have a ground clearing and a log rolling, and I had 21 hands come to a working, and I cleaned it up in one day. Did you just put out the word that you were going to have a ground clearing? Yeah, why it would tickle them to death to get to go to a workin' for they knowed they was going to get something good to eat. Who cooked for all those people? Did Margie do all that? Cooking, Margie and Mama. Mama was living then and she helped get dinner. They killed two big fat hens that day and made dumplings and they had all kinds of vegetables. Plenty of beans, pickled corn, kraut, and big old cobbler pies. They just had a real dinner. I don't know at the house raisins I went to. I bet you I've been called to 25 or 30 of them. What a time we'd have at house raisin. Callaway Levesey over on Blackwater had a good farm that run across that creek, plumb back to the top of the mountain. About two-thirds of the way up, there was a big basin with seven or eight acres that was fairly level. You could have plowed it with a tractor, only there wasn't no tractors back then. Well, he decided to build him a house up there, and he come one day to get me to help him decide where to put it. We climbed up there and picked out a place, and I told him what kind of timber to cut and how big to get it. And he put it right in and cut it and snaked it down close to the house seat. One evening, he come down to my place and said, Now I've got the log snaked in, and I'm ready for you to go to work on that house. I says, I'll tell you what to do, Callaway. Me and you can't put them logs up by ourselves. You have a workin' and get some good men, and we'll put that house up and maybe cover it in one day. Oh, he said, we can't do that in a day. I said, you get me a few good hands, and I'll show you. Well, I never seed such a crowd of men that turned out for that house raising. We put that foundation down, notched them logs, and put them up, and got half the rafters on in one day. We had a man stationed at each corner to notch the logs, and I was one of them. When we got done, Al Moore, he was Callaway's father-in-law, he went around and looked at it and said, Well, I've just been inspecting, and Alex Stewart has put up the nicest corners of every one here. I made every one of my joints fit just like they had growed there. Were the logs hewed? No, they was just round, long logs. They was 20 feet long. I believe the house was about 16 or 18 feet wide. Callaway's wife had cooked a hog's head for dinner, and she didn't take its eyes out, just cooked it whole. When we went to eat, that hog's head was sitting on the table a-looking at us. But they eat it just the same. Miss Moore and her girls come and help get dinner that day, and oh, what a dinner we had. They was about 20 hands there, and everyone worked. And none of them charged anything? 
No, they never did think about charging a penny. You can't get people to do that now. Other than workings, I suppose church meetings were one of the few times people in the community got together. Oh yes, if they had a revival, people would wrap up in bed quilts or shawls and wade the snow five or six inches deep to go to meeting. Old gray-headed fellers with beards way down to here would be a setting there and more of a crowd than you could get today. I've sat there and listened to the preacher preach many a day. Old Vidge Collins couldn't read nor write, but he'd come down there and preach, and boy, what a crowd he'd have. That man could preach. Did you ever hear of what they call protracted meetings? Oh, law, yeah. They used to have them protracted meetings in Jonesville and places like that. People would go there and camp out on the ground or stay with people or sleep in their wagons if they had them. They'd attend all the preachings and they'd visit with one another. Sometimes they'd last two or three weeks. I've heard Grandpa Stewart talk about it. They'd have a time. Another fascinating peek into the life of Alex Stewart's. Really interesting about the moonshine. Um, interesting and then kind of troubling that he, he had to drink so much. Gosh, a pint a day. I don't know how he survived that. Makes me wonder if some of that stomach trouble he talked about was directly related to that, where he talked about it in other chapters. But really interested the different ways that he hid the stills. I can't imagine digging out a, a room big enough. That's really elaborate. The good plan of the sheriff that was in on the money making, putting it in his smokehouse, that seemed like a good plan. Reminds me, I had, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but one of my videos was Sonny Rickard. He tells the story about a man in Peachtree that had the... Um, had a steel and then he had it run back to his house with water like with pipes so then where he filled his jars was actually inside the house out of the spigot and he tells that story so really interesting there another thing that was interesting about that part is all the different various things alex used to actually make liquor that long list kind of reminded me of you know there's so many things you can make jelly out of kind of reminded me of that I've read about the the drink figlin, he called it, made with honey, mead, but I've never heard it called figlin before. I've heard it called, it starts with an M, methil, methil, methilglin, I can't say it, but it starts with an M, you probably know, but I've never heard it called figlin, so I thought that was very fascinating. Of course, the story of Eli and how he kind of stabbed Alex in the back, but boy, Alex got him back. I'm glad he didn't shoot him and kill him, but I guess Alex, he was such a good hand at everything else. I'm sure he was a good shot too, and he probably knew he wasn't going to wasn't going to kill him, but he was certainly going to scare him and make sure that he'd never come back after kind of stabbing him in the back like that. And then the two other things about the liquor making that I thought was really interesting was the blanket method. That just sounds so disgusting, so disgusting. But I guess if that's all you had, no only way to do it before they figured out how to make steels. But yikes, that sounds really disgusting. Uh, and then the where the phrase bootlegger come from, I did not know that. So I learned that from Alex. I've read it before, but I forgot it, I guess, when I first read the book. But um, I liked that part. My favorite part of the reading from today, though, wasn't really the moonshine part, although that is interesting, but it wasn't that. It's that first of the next chapter that we started, the community workings. I just love that sense of camaraderie and the way people would come together to pitch in, whether it was bean stringing or corn shucking or house raising that he's talking about. I love that. I love that sense of community. Pap told me good stories, lots of different stories about things like that. Even uh, fodder pulling time, when it was time to pull your fodder, your corn shucks from the uh, field at the end of the season, and, and a lot of people would pitch in to help with that and start making all those different things and pap said that was the just like what alex described the appeal was you got to fellowship with each other that was great and you helped get the work done and in turn they would come help you get your work done so there was that but there was always good food there was always they kind of kind of made sure there was something really good to eat and that's when pap said what he really looked forward to he loved the fellowship but he always knew there'd be good food and plenty of it so he looked forward to those times so i hate that we've our society's changed in so many different ways of course you know most people um, don't need to have bean breakings because they don't break they don't grow that many beans and the same for like pulling fodder and those kind of things now we have mechanized things you know mechanical ways of doing those different things that in days gone by human hands had to do so of course a lot of things have just changed but i loved reading about that and wouldn't it be amazing to have a 
like a house raising and have a bunch of people come at one time and get your house dried in wouldn't that just be amazing of course today our you know regulations and things like that wouldn't allow for that because you have to have inspections but I, I really loved that peek into the sense of community that Alex enjoyed when where he lived there in those days especially when he was a boy I hope you'll leave a comment though and tell me what you enjoyed out of today's reading um, and as always i hope you'll drop back by next friday because we've got to see what happens to alex stewart next <music>